You're listening to Galaxy of Film. Yeah, we've got a very special episode this week planned out that we've been trying to do for a minute now. And here we are, man. We were talking more Star Wars finally. You know, we've been making for the past two years our way through the movies one by one. And here we are finally talking and tackling down the original trilogy, starting with New Hope, of course. So I'm having a good day, bro. Very good day. (laughs) Um, Joining us. Oh, go ahead, Dakari. I I just said what a lovely day. I was quoting quoting Fury Road. Sorry. Oh, okay. (laughs) Oh, boy. Um, Joining us this week is none other than Brian from Drink the Movies and the Old Republic podcast. He's here all the time. If you're not familiar with Brian, I really don't know what you're doing with your lives, guys. Yeah. Been here every week. What are you doing? Yeah, I have have been here. I haven't been on in a a few weeks, but I think, um, you know, I love going through the uh, Star Wars uh, anthology with you guys. And we're finally back to, to the start of it all. I'm very excited. Uh, about talking about Star Wars uh, New Hope today, Max. So thank you so much for having me back. Always a pleasure to come and hang out and uh, chat about movies with you guys. Of course, dude, of Thanks. course. And also, this being said, I'd like to go ahead and introduce a very special guest star. We've had this episode in the works for quite some time now. Um, we have Craig Miller, who was director of fan operations at Lucasfilm during the original trilogy. So how are you doing, sir? Welcome to the show. Um, I'm doing just fine. I'm happy to be here. It's great to get you in here, man. Like I said, we've been planning on doing this for a while. Uh, You were featured in one of our Star Wars celebration videos that we had on the YouTube channel as well. So for our listeners, link down below to that episode. Um, Yeah, this is going to be fun, talking about the original Star Wars, because this is also, like, got you working in the film industry, right? Was this film? Oh, yeah, yeah. I I just graduated college when I started working at Lucasfilm. Oh, awesome. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, you're right on our age at this point, too. That's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. That's really dope. Um, before we go ahead and start talking about the movie itself, you know, what we're all here for, I just had a couple questions for you real quick as well um, with your career at Lucasfilm, if you wouldn't mind for a second. Sure. Um, but first off, being the director of fan relations, what were some of your responsibilities to help lift off this franchise? Because this was a totally different time period we're talking about where this wasn't established at all. Oh yeah, it was a it was a very different time in in a lot of ways. Of course, no internet, mm-hmm. but science fiction wasn't popular. It's not like today where every other movie is science fiction or superheroes. Yeah. Back then, science fiction was thought of as, you know, uh, low budget for kids, not really something grown ups went to go see or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And of course, no internet, so. No, you know, everything was much more, um, you had to go in a much broader way to reach people. Um, And I was brought on at first um, in the summer of 76 before the movie came out, Mm -hmm. almost a year before the movie came out, to consult on how to reach uh, fans. I, I mean, I grew up as a science fiction comic book, movie fan. I was involved in fandom and conventions. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working with Charlie Lippincott, who was the head of marketing, basically, for what was then called the Star Wars Corporation. Okay. Um, And and advising how to reach out to fans and get them familiar with Star Wars. And Mm -hmm. Charlie and with my involvement but charlie primarily invented this um way of marketing that now everybody does which is to go out directly to the fans to the audiences um and promote it we were the first movie ever to go to like san diego comic con or any place like that uh to reach out to fans directly Mm -hmm. Um, and so my involvement at first was advisory and then I was brought on full time when actually when the film came out Mm -hmm. I was handling uh, there was an unprecedented amount of fan mail coming in 
and I continued doing convention appearances and we I started the official Star Wars fan club. I designed the membership kit. Mm -hmm. I wrote all the uh, the first several years worth of issues of Bantha Tracks, the newsletter, mm -hmm. um, and did all the fan related stuff and also did general publicity um, to you know regular places and I we were, Lucasfilm back then was a much, much smaller, less corporate company. Mm -hmm. So everyone did a little of everything. So I was like producer for Lucasfilm on things like episodes of Sesame Street with mm -hmm. R2 and 3PO on them. And I operated R2-D2. Um, That's cool. Commercials, award show, some award shows, all kinds of things. So my my job was publicist with a special focus on fans and fandom mm -hmm. but we're really all over the place doing all kinds of things okay you also, um you bringing up some of the stuff you were producing didn't you produce the uh the under Ruse commercial for star mm -hmm. wars <laughs> yeah that was wow. you, you know at, um, as part of licensing mm -hmm. we would work with our licensees on their advertising, um, we had to approve, we didn't have to approve the ads, but we had to approve the Star Wars content, mm -hmm. making sure they didn't show the characters incorrectly, stuff like that. And we would work with them as possible for appearances, like Darth Vader would do appearances, or sometimes mm -hmm. C-3PO and R2. And um, we would do the same with commercials. So one of them, and the one, one of the ones I was involved with, was Under Rules, where they designed the commercial, they figured out what they wanted to show, and we provided the Star Wars to it. You know, <laughs> the guy in the Boba Fett costume. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually know who was in the Boba Fett costume for the Under Rules commercial, but Kermit Eller, Bryce Kermit Eller was... Um, Darth Vader. He mm -hmm. was the one who did all the Darth Vader appearances in that time period. Um, and we brought um, R2. We didn't do C-3PO, I don't think, for the Under Roots commercials in terms of an appearance, but we did do R2. And I was producer for Lucasfilm on it and cooperated uh, R2. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. That's awesome. That's a weird little pocket of star wars everyone forgets yeah. about it's pretty cool actually all right that's really neat um, um Gary, go ahead. yes so my question is um while on set for empire strikes back what was a specific moment that you experienced or witnessed that um always stuck with you to this very day oh boy i spent um in different in a couple of different trips i spent three weeks or so on the sets for Empire. Um, not any of the locations, but all at Elstree Studios. So mm -hmm. I was in the Hoth Ice Cave, the mm -hmm. uh, the Carbon Freezing Chamber. I was on mm -hmm. Gagabaugh. Um, mm -hmm. So lots of different parts of um, Empire Strikes Back. Um, you know, all those scenes where Han and Chewie are on top of the Millennium Falcon repairing it. Mm -hmm. That was one of the ones I was mm -hmm. specifically there for when uh, the chunks of ice fall and hit R2 on the head just before the uh, the Wampas break in, mm -hmm. things like that. So there's, you know, um, being on a movie set, uh, is is always really cool, but it's also if you're not actually working, mm -hmm. it can be really boring at times. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, as, as cool as being in the hot ice cave is, while everyone else is busy setting up a shot and running around, mm -hmm. and you're just sort of standing there for <laughs> half an hour, um, you know, after you've been there for a week, it's mm -hmm. no longer oh look at that, look at that. But right. it's still, you know, it's still exciting. It's still interesting. And 
part of the time I was just standing around, but part of what I was doing there was interviewing people and getting information for publicity purposes, for the fan club purposes and stuff like that. So there's a lot of, you know, memorable stuff getting, you know, talking with um, a lot of the crew. I didn't know most of the British crew before coming over. The actors I knew mm -hmm. because of working on the publicity on Star Wars, on what you call A New Hope, but we never did because it wasn't cool <laughs> back, back then. Right, exactly. Um, but so uh, Mark and Harrison and, you know, those guys, I knew to an extent um, and could, would spend a little bit of time talking, but they were busy working. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I spent a lot of time talking with crew, both on set and off, like uh, Stuart Freeborn in his section of the Elstree complex where he was working on Yoda. Okay. And other cool. things. That's awesome. That's that's really incredible, actually, man. Hearing some stuff about like the original trilogy things, uh, specifically, we hear a lot about like prequel work and even some of the sequel stuff. But yeah. it's really cool hearing mm -hmm. about that early Star Wars experience. Yeah, you got to be old to have worked on <laughs> early Star Wars movie. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, let's go ahead, guys. <clears throat> let's go ahead and dive right into the movie that we've all been waiting for talking about. Um, like so this is like two years incoming on the podcast we've been <laughs> hyping up talking about the original trilogy um, so here we finally are yeah i know dakar you remember those early early days yeah man i was <laughs> geeked and we're finally here crazy yeah i'm crazy man of course yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Star Wars, otherwise known as A New Hope for newer viewers, of course, but we're just calling it Star Wars. We're going through with the original names here. Um, we have Luke Skywalker, who is on Tatooine. This is 19 years after Revenge of the Sith. Obviously, this movie came first, though, if for some reason you don't know this. Um, <laughs> but Luke Skywalker, he's on this desert planet um, as a moisture farmer for his family's farm. And all of a sudden, these two little droids who kind of just basically ruined this man's life in a sense he was a peaceful farmer and this these two droids come in and next thing this man knows he's being harassed by this random hermit in the woods telling him he needs to go with this random like space pirate and carpet guy to go across mm -hmm. the universe to save this random space bun lady it's a whole a space opera you know <laughs> yeah. um but yeah, no. Well, remember, Luke's... he wasn't a happy, peaceful farmer. He was yeah. a, a teenage kid who wanted to get the hell out of there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he wanted to go fly spaceships, man. Absolutely, he, he did, man. Yeah. Absolutely. He was um, he was longing for adventure and it showed yeah. up at his door. Yeah, in a weird ass way, but it works. Weird. <laughs> yeah, that is, be weird. careful what you wish for. You may get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's an alarming way. <laughs> Oh, then with his luck, he gets thrown into a civil war. So it just kind of kind of works out eventually, I guess. Right. <laughs> uh, but no, thankfully, you know, they figure out that the woman from this hologram that is stuck in this droid that has been sent to Luke Skywalker, just kind of showed up on his doorstep, that she's actually royalty. And not only that, but this droid contains plans to a super weapon, the ultimate space station, the Death Star, the planet killer. And this princess, this royal, this woman of royalty, is trapped on the space station. Um, and she's longing out for the hermit. She's calling, requesting for his help. Obi-Wan Kenobi, um, our hero, our young man who is learning and earning for adventure, uh, realizes that the hermit is none other than someone who knew his father and worked with his father, a man he never got to meet. Um, so he kind of like entrusts him on this journey and begins trusting the Force in a weird way. Um and goes to the Death Star, ultimately, with Han Solo and William Falcon aboard their ship, kind of not telling them what they're getting themselves into, to go save the princess. Um, upon saving the princess, Obi-Wan does go ahead and face off against Darth Vader. Um, unfortunately, he does sacrifice himself for the rebels, or the newly found rebels, to go ahead and leave the Death Star with the escape plans as well. Um, once they go ahead and leave the Death Star, they make it back to the rebel base, where they begin their big grand scheme to take down the Death Star. Um, and this becomes known as the Battle of Yavin, as we as all the fans know this by. Mm -hmm. um, during all this, Vader makes an attempt to go ahead and stop Luke as he enters his TIE fighter to go ahead and basically put a stop to the Rebel plans. Han Solo swoops in at the last minute to save Luke, 
for Luke to go ahead and then use the force to basically project these proton bombs into the Death Star where it does explode and the Rebellion is saved at this point. Um, then we have a nice ceremony with all of our heroes receiving medals, except for one hero. I, we'll never figure out why. Chewbacca <laughs> does not get a medal for some reason. Um, you know, later on, we do see him eventually get this medal, thankfully. But at this time, he doesn't get the medal. But that is Star Wars, more or less, the first one. Um, a bit simpler than the other plots <laughs> for a much simpler time. But this is what started it all, man. By all means. Um, Craig, how did you find out about star wars and the making of this like this whole thing how did you get involved in the very start of this my my involvement began i met charlie lippincott who Mm. i mentioned earlier um and uh we became friendly and he knew uh i don't mean to repeat myself but he knew that in order to market Star Wars, he had to come up with some new ways because back in the 70s, you marketed movies by getting reviews, which Mm -hmm. that they do, but you went and put your stars on talk shows. That that was the big thing. You know, you got uh, Johnny Carson was the longtime host of The Tonight Show. You got your star booked to go on The Tonight Show or whatever or various other talk shows. Hmm. There were no stars in Star Wars. Alec Guinness and Peter Cushing were stars, but they were British stars. They were known in the U.S., but more as character actors or actors in British movies. They weren't American stars. They weren't going to get booked onto the big talk shows. Hmm. And no one had ever heard of Mark or Carrie or Harrison. They did not have significant careers at that time so he had to find other ways to market it and so that's why i was one of several people he ended up talking to about how to go out to the science fiction fans directly Mm. um and we spent a lot of time working on ways both with fans and we you know, Lucasfilm, Star Wars Corporation was doing things, again, very unusual. Getting the Star Wars comic book to come out before the movie. It started coming out in March. So the third issue was on the stands when the movie came out. The novelization came out from Ballantine Books, which was a mm. big science fiction publisher. Um, you know, uh, the toy deal was made. The toys didn't come out till later, of course, but Charlie was doing what he could to license, and licensing movies was not a big thing back before Star Wars either. It happened, but it much more happened with TV shows, and even then, it wasn't a huge money maker. Mm. Um, that's why. When George said to Fox, part of his deal, he wanted a big share of the licensing and he wanted to control the licensing. Fox was like, yeah, sure, give it to him. We can pay him less money. It's (laughs) almost, you know, it wasn't going to affect their profits, giving away the toy licensing. Mm. Well, that was the last time any studio gave away the toy licensing. (laughs) But But it wasn't a bad decision by Fox based on what they knew at the time. Mm -hmm. It made perfect sense for them. Star Wars just broke all the rules. Just everything came out differently than anything been happening before. Um, And, you know, I've now forgotten what your question was. (laughs) Well, let me ask you this question as well, too. This is following up with this. Um, When was your first time, like, watching A New Hope? I saw Star Wars, um, I don't know the exact date, but Mm. maybe two weeks before it came out. Okay. It came out May 25th, so I saw it earlier in May Mm. uh, at a screening room at Fox. Mm. Um, And... I, you know, remember, lifetime of science fiction fan, lifetime Mm -hmm. movie fan, 
and just like everybody else, I'm you know the movie starts, and that big ship comes on and keeps going and going and going, and I'm like, this is the movie I've always wanted to see. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were doing the slideshows at conventions the year before Star Wars came out. Even science fiction fans knew that most science fiction movies of the period were pretty bad. Mm -hmm. So they would go to the, these presentations at conventions, dubious at best. And the result we were getting from them was they'd go in dubious and they'd come out, wow, this looks really good. If they can actually pull this off and make this movie, it's going to be good. Now, I went in to the movie thinking, this is going to be good. I'm going to like this. But I had, you know, honestly, I had no belief I would be so turned on by it and it would so much fulfill what I'd always hoped a science fiction movie could be. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, man. I mm. really got early on us too, man. <laughs> Seeing it two weeks early, that's incredible, actually, for A New Hope. Yeah. That is that is incredible. Um. Brian, do you know when the like your earliest memory of New Hope is, or because do you? Oh, yeah. yeah, this is a weird yeah. one for me, but go ahead. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't remember exactly how old I would have been. So I was born in 1981. So I was uh, just a little bit on the young side to have mm. gotten to experience Star Wars. Um, in the theater. So my first exposure to it would have been on home video. I think the the home video release was in 1982. Um, I probably would have seen it, I guess, like in 1984, um, probably 1985, something like that. Um, but my my brother, who is seven years older than me, was kind of in that uh, kind of peak generation. So I think that, you know, I probably would have been exposed to it early because when it came out on video, you know, that would have been a story that he liked and toys that he had and, you know, him and my dad could watch it. So, you know, mm -hmm. I was just like the the little kid there getting getting exposed to it early kind of, you know, vicariously through them. Um, and I, I specifically do remember, I don't remember when I saw it the first time, but, um, it, it's very vivid. My mom worked at a dental office, which was just a couple blocks away from our big, um, kind of county library. And she would go there and rent movies a couple nights a week, uh, cause you could get them for free. And I, I very distinctly remember being a kid and anytime that 20th century Fox logo came on the screen, like I like held my breath. I'm like, yes, she got Star Wars again. Let's let's go. And anytime it wasn't Star Wars, I was just like deflated. I was like, I don't care what movie this is. Uh, it's not Star Wars. Not interested in it. So I remember that very vividly. But yeah, I grew up with it. Um, you know, just a, a home video. That was uh, my exposure to uh, Star Wars. Probably, like I said, four or five years old, something like that. So. Okay, gotcha, Ooh. man. Gotcha. Oh, hi, Mark. I have a weird, weird way of how I discovered the first Star Wars as well, too, Brian. Um, <laughs> I don't know what year it was, but I know I did see Revenge of the Sith in theaters when I was like five. Um, so that's what got me into Star Wars, like I said during that episode. Mm -hmm. But it was either the Christmas of 2005 or 2006, I'd want to say. And I had an uncle give me the special edition DVD box set of the original trilogy. Which is ultimately how I got into them. And I, I don't remember watching them for the first time, but I think my first vivid memory was um, <laughs> when I was like seven years old, my dad's like minivan was broken into in our front yard and I had a portable DVD player. <laughs> and yeah. it had like a copy of Return of the Jedi in the DVD player. And I remember running out when like the police report were there, doing the police report, whatever. And I was asking about my copy of Return of the Jedi. Like, I was so worried that it was gone. But I was so relieved to find my copy of A New Hope in the van still. So I don't know why the hell they didn't take that one. But they did <laughs> take Terrible, terrible thieves. Terrible. <laughs> um, but I think that's my earliest memory of A New Hope. Like, not necessarily watching it, but just of that weird stolen minivan. Wait, 
Wait, so your earliest memory of A New Hope is having your van broken into and the Return of the Jedi? That's, that doesn't make any sense, Max. <laughs> no, they left A New Hope in there, man. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. A New right. Hope was my saving grace. Yeah, they must have not seen it, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, it's even funnier because I have that license plate above my desk right now. Awful. See? Um, Very nice. It's come full circle. <laughs> Dakari, what is your earliest memory with A New Hope? Okay, well, my earliest memory with A New Hope was around the time I was about either five or six years old. Okay. And this is when I was getting exposed to movies like Wizard of Oz and Seven Samurai, like just getting exposed to all these standards because of my dad. You mm -hmm. know, he will always, um, even if he didn't, if, if it was his way of saving money, like burning copies of different movies. You know, instead of just, you know, going out to Walmart every day and buying movies, you can save money by doing that. So, but he didn't burn a copy of the original trilogy. He actually had VHS copies okay. of the original trilogy. They weren't the special editions. Those were the copies from, I think, Fox or, was it Fox or CBS video that they put out? And, and, yeah, CBS video in the 80s. It was the trilogy box set. And I'm just like, my dad, he brought it to my grandmother's house one day and he put in uh, the first Star Wars movie. And I vaguely remember everything that happened in it, but I always remember the Battle of Yavin. The Battle of Yavin at the end of the movie, I always remember. And that was my first time experience of Star Wars. And ever since I, it just kind of stuck with me, you know? So uh, that was, uh, that was pretty much my first. It was my dad who really kind of, brought that to light because I always knew about Star Wars even before then but I just never really sat down and actually watched the movies up okay. until that point and I was about five or six years old so my life kind of changed after that. I'm impressed at being introduced to Seven Samurai at five or six years old. <laughs> yes yes my my dad was he, he every time I talk about movies about my dad he always says that no I wasn't in the movies like that dude you know about Seven Samurai for crying out loud. How are you not into movies like that? Dude, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Five years old, man. <laughs> oh. Um, obviously, we all have a deep love for, for Star Wars. And, of course, this movie that started it all. Um, I'm very curious, though, because I'm pretty sure we're all, you know, we all love this movie, of course. But what are some standout moments of the film that, like, I guess we could call them our favorites. I don't want to limit them to just being a one favorite. Um, but Brian, what is the standout moment for you in particular that like when you think of A New Hope is the automatic oh. like scene <laughs> or sequence that you think of? The automatic. Uh, yeah, uh, picking one. That is, that's ridiculous, Max, because uh, I mean, <laughs> basically it's it's basically all the moments. Um, I, I... I don't know when I th when I think of a new hope. Like if you just if you if you if you did like a word association, if you just said a new hope, what do I think mm -hmm. of um, immediately? And it's probably because I was a little uh, kid when I saw this the first time, and therefore it's kind of like the most fun uh, kind of sequence, I guess, of a new hope. I think of trash compactor. That's what I think of when I think of uh, uh, Star Wars: A New Hope. If you if you just have me uh, just rattle one thing off, but I this this is a movie full of uh, amazingly fun. Uh, things that happen, fun characters, um, and and that's one of the neat things that I really like about Star Wars is you can you can look at it and you have, if you ask ten people you know who their favorite Star Wars character is you're going to get ten different answers right because it's depending on you know the time and place that you're watching it who you'd identify with. Um, my favorite uh, character is R two D two, so basically any time that uh, that he's in the shot is my favorite. Um, and but you know he's basically the hero of New Hope anyways. But but yeah, Trash Compactor uh, that's my go to if I have to pick pick one moment. Okay, gotcha. Man. I'll leave. I'll leave the Death Star for for you guys to talk to talk about. <laughs> oh man, I was about to say my actually my favorite sequence is um when Luke and Obi Wan are going to go see the Falcon for the first time and they're calling it what a hunk of junk. I there's this level in the Lego Star Wars game where Han and Chewie have to leave the cantina and go through like the streets and the alleyways to like the the garage for the Falcon basically for the hangar and even though that's such a stretched out thing in the game and it's such a very, very brief thing and they don't even see them really leaving the bar other than like the store and shippers come in to check them out one time and then we cut there. I really like seeing the reaction of the Falcon's reveal. It's not this grand, like exquisite, you know, thing everyone's anticipating 
it is a hunk of junk, but it's like the homiest, coziest hunk of junk in the galaxy that um, instantly we're familiar with in a sense that like we know this is home for these characters from now on almost. And we see later on, like it reestablishes that obviously we see like Luke training with the, uh, with the droid, like the, the helmet droid in the Millennium Falcon, which is pretty cool. But one of the other scenes I really like a lot that kind of like reinforces the reveal of the Falcon for me is when Luke is mourning Obi-Wan's death and he's laying at the, the hollow chest table when Leia puts the blanket over him at that sense, I can almost feel that like, the ship is a character from that point on. We're seeing more and more of it. We're seeing more of the interior of it, seeing some of the characteristics of it we see going on in the other ones. But those two scenes in particular are definitely like my favorite in such an odd way for New Hope. Um, Craig, what are some standalone or standout moments for you that you think of right away? Uh, well, you know, the, that opening shot that I mentioned before with the ship coming onto the stay onto the screen, which I think for so many people, it's like, just an oh my god moment mm -hmm. um it's just the movie's just so full of great moments you know um between the different characters and i mean some of them are in some ways cliched but they play out um the whole thing with the the triangle between luke and han and the princess and han mm -hmm. sees and looking at Luke is like, oh, he's a young, love-struck kid, and um, saying, oh, yeah, I could go for her, knowing that would get a rise out of Luke, and mm. it's going, you know, I care, and, you know, just all that kind of little banter between all the characters that just say so much about them as people. They're not just um, stick figures running through the scene. Um you know the the death star uh, the the death star trench sequence mm -hmm. plays so well. Uh, there's just so much going on in the movie that it just all builds together to be such a great um, a great thing that pulls us all in, pulled me in, and just made me want to be involved to just fall in love with it as a movie and with the characters. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yes. Gosh. Dakari, what about you, man? See, when you ask me what's my favorite moment in A New Hope, mm -hmm. like, I always just have, like, a spiritual battle with myself. I'm like, why Why would somebody even ask me this damn question? <laughs> um off the top, though, it's got to be the sequence where Obi-Wan and Darth Vader have their lightsaber duel. Okay. It, it, it's not just the lightsaber duel. It's also everything that is happening around it. You have them uh, just um, having a battle culminating all their um, sorrows and all the things that 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 has happened to them beforehand leading up to that point. While also you have Han and Luke trying to save Leia from the Empire and try to, uh, you know, bring her back to the Rebellion, of course. And while that is happening, you've got the two forefathers of the Triangle battling it out, selling some old scores. And when you see, you know, Obi-Wan perish after Darth Vader strikes him, that's kind of an impactful moment for me because, you know, one of the things I always love about Star Wars is that, yes, you always will have your old hermits and your the teacher showing and guiding the guiding the student um, in a certain way, but there's also eventually where the, it, it, there's eventually always that moment where the master, and the teacher has to obviously leave. He obviously has to move on for the student to become the master. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's possibly the best example of that um, trope that occurs in Star Wars all the time, in my opinion. So there's so many great moments in this movie, but that has to be the standout one, mainly because of everything that's happening around it, and plus the main attraction, which is the duel, in my opinion. It's not the best-looking duel. Of course, this is the first Star Wars movie, so they obviously had no idea what they were doing. They obviously had no idea how it was going to come out. So mm -hmm. the geography is not going to be the best-looking, but 
you got to understand what's going on thematically um, at its core regarding the battle. You know what I'm saying? So Absolutely, man. That's why I got to pick that for now, you know? <laughs> oh, I feel you. Absolutely, man. I absolutely yeah. agree with what you're saying. Absolutely. Um, gosh, you guys are going to hate me for this one. I'm about to ask another favorite question. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Let's talk favorite characters for a minute in this one. This is something we always ask about with some of these Star Wars films. Oh. Or favorite reoccurring characters since you guys have been on the show prior as well for some of these movies. Um, my personal favorite character in this film is Ben Kenobi. Um, mm. I really appreciate the Ben Kenobi stuff and like segment of his life more and more as I get older, especially after watching the Kenobi show. Um, we all hear the line the from a certain point of view where he's kind of telling Luke not the full truth, but just enough to keep him going on and on. It is like I have my weird feelings about it. You know, there's always the what if scenario, like what if new Luke knew the full truth right from the beginning, you know, but like. I think him covering the past for a brighter future is is something like really special at this one. Like Obi-Wan, we, we kind of see in this where he realizes like, you know, this is he has failed in a sense. You know, that time's over, he's made peace with it. We see that in Kenobi, which is one of the things I like that show a lot about. Um, but this is no longer that story for him. He can't sit here and home on this and just kind of like bring it up to the forefront for the new people to get involved with either necessarily he knows there is a greater cause at hand and even though these characters will know the full story eventually it's not his part to go ahead and make sure all that is unveiled right away mm -hmm. um that's something like i've or i just respect a bit more and more as i get older with ben i'm not sure why in particular um but yeah he's definitely been like the character to grow on me the most out of this um, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's weird because I'm a prequels kid. You know, I grew up with Ewan as Obi-Wan and James Earl Taylor in the Clone Wars. So it's like, I had, you know, Alec Guinness as kind of like the back burner Obi-Wan for me. Um, so growing up and as an adult, like I'm very appreciative that I do enjoy him more and more the more I watch the original trilogy. Um, Brian, what is your favorite character from this film? <laughs> Yeah, um, I, well, as I just mentioned it, but R2-D2 is my favorite uh, Star Wars character, my favorite character uh, from this film. Um, mm -hmm. Just there, I was always really drawn to just um, how emotive R2-D2 was, um, how <laughs> how useful in kind of every situation uh, R2 was there to to kind of save the day time, time and time again. Um, yeah, so I've always just been really drawn uh, to R2-D2 as a character. Um, as I've as I've grown up with star wars and you know we've gotten more star wars story you know um beyond the original trilogy when i when i look back at it um now if i was picking like an alternate uh kind of favorite character i really um like chewbacca as a character and i don't think chewbacca gets enough uh okay. sort of love and attention um when everyone's talking about their favorite characters um just because you know chewbacca is the kind of ultimate uh best friend ally um you know will you know kind of do anything for anyone all the people that you know uh, he loves and will you know go above and beyond to to protect so chewbacca has really kind of grown on me um as a favorite character you know throughout the the time i've gotten to uh live uh with star wars um in my life but yeah r2d2 is my my favorite character for sure okay good picks man good picks Craig, what about you, man? I know that obviously it's a bit more biased. You got to see these characters in person as well. So, I mean, what is, if you can narrow it down, who would it be? Well, you know, it it's it's difficult, as as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I agree with Brian. I love R2 as a character. Um, you know, that I got to operate R2 from time to time makes mm -hmm. him even more a favorite. But... I just like all the different things, you know, he's the keeper of the secrets. He knows everything that's going on. And if you remember in the semi-original plan, when George was talking about all the movies, R2 and 3PO were going to be the only characters who appeared in all of the movies. Mm -hmm. And it was really going to be the story of the droids um, and all this other stuff was around them. I mean, yes, it was the Skywalker saga, but mm -hmm. they were the continuing um, view we would have of it. Um, and, you know, I just really like R2. I also like Princess Leia. I think she's a great 
female character, you know, not not the helpless maiden being rescued. She has a personality. She is strong. Mm -hmm. She knows what's going on. She's smart. She's funny. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, the characters, Luke, Han, they both have things that appeal. I mean, I mean, it sounds like I'm going to tell you I love everybody. And (laughs) in some ways I do, but Mm -hmm. but, uh, if I had to pick one, it would be R2. Okay. That's fair, man. It's fair. I got you. Dakari, what about you, man? This is so funny, but um, I have to agree with you, Max. It's Obi-Wan in this movie for me. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> literally the same things you said about Obi-Wan just now I agree with. It's just um, it's the fact that his character is, is an anecdote for not only Luke and Leia, but also for himself. Because mm-hmm. he has to, this is him reestablishing himself after everything that's happened in the past. Him becoming a hermit, him becoming just this uh, occasional wanderer in the desert, you know, just trying to live his life the best he possibly can after all the chaos and turmoil that occurred in the Clone Wars and with his best friend, Vader, mm-hmm. you know? So I say anecdote for Luke because after Aunt Beru and his Uncle Owen dies or is killed, you see the aspirations for him wanting to be a Jedi Knight. You see that glow in his eyes. And I'm pretty sure Obi-Wan Kenobi saw that same glow in Luke's eyes that he saw in Anakin's eyes. Mm -hmm. You know? So the way he kind of just guides him through all that while also warning him and not giving him too much detail about who his father really is just kind of says a lot about his character. He was trying to prepare him for the biggest battle of his life, and he didn't even know it yet. Mm -hmm. And Obi-Wan Kenobi was also bracing himself for that battle. And he was simultaneously going through that same thing, his, his battle at the same time with Vader and the Empire. It was undone. Nothing was finished. Scores still had to be settled. Mm-hmm. So the fact that Obi Wan Kenobi was still um, not re- not only just reigning true to his character, but reigning true to but reigning true to who he was as a master throughout this entire film just stood out to me. You know, just a helping hand not only for himself but for the newer generation of people that he had to end up guiding and leading. So that's why Obi Wan Kenobi is my favorite, specifically in this movie. That's a great way of putting it, man. With yeah. more Obi Wan stuff, that's excellent, actually. I yes, think sir. it's, I think it's interesting because you guys are both younger, so your kind of Star Wars lens is viewed more through the prequels. So you identify mm-hmm. more right. with Obi Wan Kenobi, um, you know. Whereas, um, you know, Craig, myself, who really kind of experienced Star Wars um, as Star Wars, that was that was it, and was less important. And I think it'll be interesting, you know. 15 years from now you know kids that were your age when the sequel trilogy came out like how they'll view the original trilogy characters is it all going to be you know luke and han and chewie and and leia are they gonna you know how that's going to kind of shift as we keep getting more and more stories and the entry points kind of keep shifting generationally i think that that's interesting that's a good point man that is that is very interesting to think about the future um yeah man i don't know that'll be weird to think about honestly gosh I mean, that mm-hmm. makes me feel very old just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, geez. Um, usually this is the part of the show where I ask for everyone's ratings of the films, but we usually don't do that with the Star Wars movies just because, you know, we all love Star Wars, clearly. Um, Brian, what are your final comments to wrap up on your thoughts and your process for Star Wars A New Hope? Um, uh, so my final thoughts for Star Wars A New Hope, it, it's my favorite movie. Um of okay. all time on, on my, wow. my whole ranking of movies it's it's my favorite star wars movie but i don't like to really get into ranking the star wars movies too much but yeah it's it's something that i grew up with and became a part of my life um you know i've been on here to talk with you uh several times i have a podcast you know dedicated to talking about star wars mm. uh every every week it's just it, it's taken up <laughs> taken up residence in my mind and it's it's amazing it changed 
<laughs> quite literally it changed the world in terms of movie making the way that movies were made could be made what was possible um you know that's that i can't even imagine craig you said you started working for uh, lucasfilm in uh 76 how how that changed from like 76 to 78 <laughs> like how different uh, that world got <laughs> oh it, just uh, astonishingly different yeah. um, <laughs> you know the world uh, my world certainly changed. Uh, the filmmaking changed um, in in you know the technologies of it. So much of technology and films that has happened happened because, if not Star Wars directly, but many of the things Star Wars, the Star Wars movies, and ILM. Mm -hmm have been at the forefront of pushing forward um so it's gone well beyond just the star wars movies and and science fiction movies there isn't there's almost no movie that doesn't have cgi in it at this point um you know rom-coms have cgi for backgrounds and getting rid of traffic and mm -hmm. you know just all that kind of stuff and it's all the kind of stuff that came out of developments for special effects that happened because of Star Wars. Absolutely, yeah. man. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, just uh, closing thoughts for me, and then I'll I'll turn it over. It's it's a perfect movie. I love it. I love it so much. It's a it's a perfect exploration of the hero's journey. Uh, you have so many characters and locations that are interesting and fun. Um, if you're a kid, you love this movie. If you're an adult, you love this movie. And yeah, Star Wars: A New Hope. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, this is um, this is like my comfort movie in a sense of all of Star Wars. Um, the world building in this is incredible, especially not just from showing different locations, but from all the species as well. Obviously, the cantina stuff going on. Um, and because of that, this movie makes me feel like a little kid more and more as I watch it. I try to make make sure at least I watch this once a year um, just so I can try to pick out a different detail every time I'm watching this. Um, yeah, I mean, like you I said, this movie changed my life. You know, I have a Star Wars tattoo everywhere I go. I will always remember every effect from this movie because of that. Um, this is a huge inspiration for myself from getting into filmmaking um, it put me on to so many wonderful actors and, and actresses who are involved in this as well and introduced me to their films going on forward that's not just Star Wars. Um, I mean, this this movie did so much, honestly. There's not much... I, I don't know even how what else I could say that hasn't been said, honestly, other than, like, this is, like you said, Ryan, a perfect movie and will always have, like, a defining staple in my heart and in my life. Um, yeah, man, this is... This is a, an insane movie to start off a franchise with. It truly is. An uh, incredible foundation for such as well. Um, Dakari, what about you, man? What are your final comments and thoughts? Right. So, um, well, before 1977, of course, you had the building blocks to the blockbuster. Uh, mm -hmm. No pun intended. Um, 1925 is Ben-Hur. Uh, the first incarnation of Ben-Hur on film. Um, 1939 was The Wizard of Oz. Um, 1942 was Casablanca. 1955, Ten Commandments. Uh, 1960, Psycho, which isn't really an action movie, but it was in very much a blockbuster in terms of how it impacted the audience and how it influenced the horror genre to this very day. People are still talking about this movie the same way people are talking about Star Wars, 1977. Um, yeah, this is also my favorite film in the franchise. It's in my top 10 films of all time. In, in comparison to all the other films in the franchise, there's no other film that's as pure and organic as this one. Like, you can just feel all the energy, just feel all the, the craftsmanship on this play. It's tangible, it's palpable, everything about it is just, you know, just... <sighs> I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I can't think of the word right now, but the, the, there's a reason why people talk about this movie to this day. It set the standards for so many things that you see in films right now. Mm -hmm. And without Star Wars, we wouldn't have 
the blockbusters we have today. We wouldn't have all these sci-fi movies. We wouldn't have all these superhero movies. Hell, we wouldn't even have the sequels. We wouldn't even have the prequels or the sequel trilogy if it weren't for this movie. You know what I'm saying? So the fact that we still get to witness something like this and view it as a template of something, of, of things that we've grown accustomed to in cinema is a blessing. Um, yeah, a staple in blockbuster cinema always will be. Um, my favorite film in the franchise, my favorite Star Wars film overall. Um, yeah, perfect movie, 10 out of 10, A+. Plus. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Covered all the bases. That's that all one. I got to say about it for now. <laughs> Covered all the bases of that one, buddy. <laughs> yeah, it's just what, what's more to be said about Star Wars than what's already been said. I mean, it's it's a it's a masterpiece, man. Absolutely, absolutely. Craig, what would your final comments for Star Wars be? Well, you know, Star Wars obviously personally had a great effect on my life. The as, as a film fan, as a science fiction fan, it's a terrific film. We, mm -hmm. you know, you could knock certain things about it. A little of it's kind of hokey. There's some cliche stuff in it. Um, you know, the dialogue has some issues, mm -hmm. but overall, it just works. All the pieces fit together. They fit together perfectly. It's just so enjoyable. Um, you know, and that was a period where the movies were, uh, we I used to call them, and then they all got run over by a truck movies because the <laughs> endings were all down, mm -hmm. and you know they were all like Russian novels, and George and Gary specifically wanted to make an adventure movie that they would like to see, mm -hmm. and they didn't. They knew there were other people who would like it too. They didn't realize how many, and it really shifted so much about, you know, the kind of movies that were getting made, and it's just, you know, a wonderful movie. It draws you in. It's exciting. It's fun. There's romance. There's comedy. There's everything you could want in it, and, and I just, you know, I really enjoyed it, and it's been a part of my life for... 40, what is it, five years now, 46 years. Roughly, yeah. Since I got involved with it. Um, and it, you know, and no one could have possibly imagined we'd still be talking about it or that they'd still be making Star Wars movies this many years later. And um, I, ju I just want to add that I have a book out Oh, oh yes, well, awesome. Star Wars yeah. Memories, mm -hmm. which is all about making Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, the three year and a half years I was at Lucasfilm, mm -hmm. um, all stories about it that you haven't read before. It's not well. This is how we made the lightsabers, but yeah, because that's all been covered. But it's all about different things about making the movies, fandom in the movies. Uh, mm. the characters are a bunch of interviews with Mark and Harrison and um, George and Irv Kirshner and lots of other stuff about it. You can get it on Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com or even Walmart has it online. Okay, sweet, man. I do have a copy as well. I you know you bring those around when you go to conventions and whatnot, too. So be on the lookout if any of our listeners are in that scene, which is pretty awesome. Pretty awesome indeed. Dakari, I think that's going to wrap it up for this week, man. Yes, sure is. And it's going to be it, dude. Brian, my man, you're always welcome here, of course. You're here pretty much every other week, like we said. <laughs> Where yeah. can our listeners find you if they don't follow you already? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you uh, so much for having me back on. I uh, really appreciate it, uh, Max and Dakari. Um, yeah, if you want to find me, if you uh, somehow thought that what I said was interesting, you can check out my podcast, Drink the Movies, and the Older Public Podcast, uh, just anywhere. Wherever you're listening to this, you'll find those there, too. And if you want to connect with me online, you can find me on Instagram. It's at Astro underscore Droid underscore, which is mostly just me uh, posting uh, nonsense about uh, Star Wars things that I'm watching and buying and <laughs> doing so uh yeah thanks again for having me craig it was a, a pleasure getting to uh, share a screen with you here for for a little bit and uh thanks all the listeners out there 
course, man. Of course. Craig, it's been an honor having you on the show, man. We've been talking about doing this for quite some time. Um, I know obviously you just listed off where people can find your book. Where else can people find you and your work over the years? Uh, well, you know, I'm I'm old, so I'm on Facebook. Mm. They can find me uh, as as me, as Craig Miller. And to know which Craig Miller, it's the one with the uh, photo of me with the Millennium Falcon at the top <laughs> of it. So that'll be different from any other Craig Miller. And there's also uh, a Star Wars Memories Facebook page. Okay. Um, I'm on I'm on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn, but I'm hardly ever on any of those. So okay. Uh, so you can reach me there, but I'm I'm busy on on still on Facebook. Gotcha. Links and down below to all that, guys. Conventions. Of course. Of course, man. Of course. Gosh. Links down below for everyone, for all of you know our guest stars, the social medias and whatnot, and for Craig's book, of course, and for the video we did that Craig has featured in earlier this year from our Star Wars Celebration Anaheim series. Um, Dakari, you can find all of his work, of course, on our website, galaxyoffilm.com. Along with the rest of our podcast, our short films and our videography work as well, it's galaxyoffilm.com. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok and Facebook at Galaxy of Film. If you enjoy the show, please consider us leaving us an iTunes and Spotify review. It truly does help out the show much more than you can imagine. And stay tuned, guys. Next week on the show, we're having a special talking about some Johnny Depp films. So stay tuned for that, and we'll talk to you guys next time. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.